All right. Um, all aboard. The Dharma train is leaving. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors, uh, the theme is going to be a fun one tonight. So we are going to talk about achintya, which means inconceivable. But I do have to tell you that I there's a typo, or or is there a typo? <laughs> because if you looked on the SFDC website or the social media, we put that the theme for tonight is achintya, not achintya, but achintya, which actually is a kind of a very, very, very high number and an uncalculably high number. So you can see that there's sort of a relationship between these two words, the idea of something being achintia, inconceivable, and then a number that is so high that it is inconceivable, achintia. So we're gonna be kind of actually working at the intersection of those two ideas tonight. Um, I'll tell you that um, the, the theme for tonight does appear in the sutra, so it's why I chose it. But I also chose it because of Noam, Noam had a great question last week. He'd asked about the nayutas, the um, uh, myriads, uh, these myriad amounts of things. And we had been hearing last week about these hundreds of billions of millions of nayutis, of incalculable numbers of myriads of things. And so I wanted to talk about that idea of all this, um, well, I suppose you could call it hyperbole, if you would like. Um, actually, I think maybe after tonight, we, we may reconsider calling it hyperbole. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, we're going to talk about the idea of achintia, achintia, inconceivability. So... As usual, I'm going to start off by saying a few um, a few words about this idea in general. Uh, actually, I have quite a few examples to give you to to work through this idea, uh, and then we'll see how it appears in in the text that we've been reading. So, I was actually before uh, the class started, I was trying to do a little bit of quick research, and the little about a little bit of research that I did in the hour before class, I couldn't find any real instances of this idea of inconceivability or in actually the inconceivable. I couldn't find any references to it in the Pali, like in the Pali canon. Even if you do find it, I would still say, kind of still feel safe in saying that this idea of inconceivability is very much a, a Mahayana Buddhist idea. It's going to be very much something that uh, distinguishes the Mahayana tradition is all of its talk about the inconceivable. So um, as I mentioned, the language, there's a little bit of crossover between the idea of incalculability and inconceivability. But in terms of inconceivability, it it, it is what it sounds like. Uh, it's this idea of beyond conception, beyond conceivability, unthinkable in that sense. And it's going to be tempting to equate the idea of inconceivable with like ideas like emptiness or even ideas like tathata or suchness, these kind of other other big ideas that we discuss on Sunday nights. But tonight, what I really want to do is kind of point at how the inconceivable is a, it's an idea all unto itself. So to start us off, um, yeah, I'm, so I'm actually going to be doing kind of a, oh, I don't know what you would call it. Um, I've just, we're going to do a little bit of digging. We're going to do a little bit of digging into the origin of this idea and then the development of this idea and then see it in, in action in, in our sutra tonight. So for me, 
the origin of this idea and not the origin. I don't want to make it sound like this is the, where it comes from, but the number one place to go to learn about this idea of the inconceivable is going to be the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. I know I'm always mentioning this sutra and you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're in the world of Buddhism, you know that the, the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra is very important. It is very important. It's where a lot of these ideas kind of originate. And again, I use that term originate very hesitantly because I don't want to make it sound like the Vajra Sutra is necessarily the first instance I don't want to make it sound like the Vajra Sutra is the oldest first instance of these things. It's just that the Vajra, Vajra Sutra is sort of the, well, it's where you would go to find definitive answers to things in that way, as far as how ideas are being used. So the idea of the, of the inconceivable, uh, Chintya, it, it runs throughout the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra. And its first occurrence, the first occurrence of this idea occurs very, very early on in the sutra. It, it occurs in chapter four. And, you know, if you're not familiar with the, the Diamond Sutra, with the Vajra Sutra, it's a very kind, seemingly simple sutra. And it's simple because all it is, is a back and forth dialogue between the Buddha and a monk named Subhuti. There's no miracles per se. Uh, there's no zillions of bodhisattvas. There's no gods per se and all of that. Just Subhuti and the Buddha. And in their dialogue, what makes the Vajra Sutra so profound, kind of so interesting, is that it's very short. It's broken into these 32 tiny little chapters, some of which are only a paragraph long. But there's a really interesting way that the Vajra Sutra, it, it like builds up and builds up and builds up these kind of really interesting ideas. And so the inconceivable being one of those ideas it first occurs in chapter four, and what, and what it is in reference to is in reference to the idea of, of merit, punya. Punya would be the, the term or the expression, but you know the idea of merit, it's, it's always a tricky idea um, to discuss, especially if it's an audience if you, if you don't think in terms of merit or punya. But, you know, the idea is, is we're talking about culti what would be called cultivation, practice. And the idea is, is that whether you're thinking about the practice of meditation, like seated meditation, or the practice of giving, of being generous, or the practice of moral discipline, following precepts, being honest, being nonviolent, things like that. The idea of merit or, or punya, it's the idea that there is some advantage to doing meditation, that there's some advantage to being generous and that there's some advantage to, you know, practice in that sense. So, in India, which you, you may already be aware, there's an idea that if you do good things or you do spiritual or religious practice, you accrue or you kind of get in that sense, this merit, punya. And yeah, in some traditions, this, this merit or this punya is sort of quantifiable in some sense, but we don't need to think about it in terms of its quantifiability. But what we wanna be thinking about is like, why meditate? 
why be moral? Why do any kind of practice? The idea is, is that there's some benefit to it, that there's something gained from doing it versus not doing it. And it doesn't really matter if you're like in India and you're thinking about punya and reincarnation and merit, or if you're just thinking about the advantage to doing something, the, the benefits of doing something versus not doing it. In either case, we're talking about the idea of merit. And what chapter four is about of the Vajra Sutra is about the amount of merit that a bodhisattva gets for understanding the Vajra Sutra, for sharing the teachings of the Vajra Sutra, for practicing the contents of the Vajra Sutra. But the idea is that chapter four is this idea of a bodhisattva. What kind of merit, how much merit do they get? And the reason why this question is being asked is because in chapter three of the Vajra Sutra, the Buddha told Sabuti this profound, wild idea about there actually not being any sentient beings. There actually not being any life. And effectively, they're not being any reincarnation. Now, what they're kind of talking about, of course, is, it, is an extension of this teaching of no self. That if there is no self, there is no one to be alive or not be alive. And therefore, there is no one to die and be reborn. And therefore, in that sense, there is no cycle of death and rebirth. Uh, uh, so Buddha, if there's no one and no one to practice and nothing to practice and there's no rebirth, then what's the point of doing anything? What's the advantage of doing anything? There's, there's nobody to gain from any of this. And so there's, and so kind of to summarize, given this teaching of emptiness and no self, why bother? <laughs> why bother that's kind of the nature of the question in chapter four which is sort of like well then what about the merit of a bodhisattva who understands there's no self no sentient being no life no reincarnation and all of that and in to address that idea to address the merit received by bodhisattvas the Buddha in chapter four of the Vajra Sutra does something weird. It's almost like a mini visualization meditation. And what he says to Subhuti, the Buddha says, hey, Subhuti, can you conceive of, and he actually sort of, yeah, can you conceive of all of the space in the eastern direction. And Subhuti thinks about it for a second and says, no, you, you can't conceive of the, all of the space in the eastern direction. The Buddha says, well, how about west? How about north? How about south? How about the four intermediate directions? How about above and below? Can you measure all of the space above you? That's a lot. It goes, it goes on forever, right? So Subhuti says, no, it's inconceivable. The, the amount of space that way, that way, that way, that way, it's inconceivable. And the Buddha ends this chapter by saying, yeah, and bodhisattvas receive merit like that. Inconceivable amounts. And it's a really kind of interesting, you know, introduction to this idea of the inconceivable. And what's interesting about it is, is that it's not that a bodhisattva doesn't receive merit. It's that the merit a bodhisattva receives is beyond conception. 
It's inconceivable. And so the first thing I want to say tonight about the idea of inconceivability is that it's sort of the beginning of the answer of that it, the Buddha doesn't say no, the, the, the bodhisattvas don't receive any merit because of emptiness, because of no self, because of these things. They receive inconceivable merit. So, okay. Then what happens is, is that this conversation about merit, the unique, kind of the unique nature of merit as cultivated by bodhisattvas, that conversation continues and it, it kind of weaves in and out of the Vajra Sutra. There'll be a chapter about this idea of merit and inconceivability, and then it goes away for a while, and then it comes back, and then it goes away for a while. And every time in the sutra that it comes back, the Buddha's, uh, again, it's like a mini visualization meditation, but the mini visualization meditation keeps getting more and more grandiose, for lack of a better term, kind of just expansive. And so what I want to, the next chapter I want to share with you regarding this is from chapter 11. And this, so th this has already popped up, I think, a couple of more times before this. But then chapter 11 of the Vajra Sutra reads something like this. The Buddha says to Sabuti, hey, Sabuti, if there were as many Ganges rivers as there are grains of sand in the Ganges River, what do you think? Would the grains of sand in all those Ganges rivers be many or not? And Subhuti says, world honored one, just one, just the Ganges River alone has an inconceivable or an incalculable amount of sand. How much more so all those Ganges rivers, right? And ultimately in the chapter, the Buddha is going to say, and, and bodhisattvas who practice and share the Vajra Sutra, yeah, they get merit like that. <laughs> and so I want to pause on this because this is, of course, a very famous um, Mahayana Buddhist analogy, the analogy of the grains of sand in the Ganges River. Now, I want to pay very close attention to this analogy. The Buddha says, if there was a Ganges River for every grain of sand in the Ganges River, and now let's start trying to think about all of the grains of sand in all of those Ganges rivers, right? It, it boggles the mind, of course, to try to even begin to calculate or even conceive of it, 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 infinite, infinite in a way doesn't even quite capture that amount, if you know what I mean, because we're talking about an entire Ganges River for each tiny little grain of sand in the Ganges River. Truly inconceivable. So one thing the Vajra Sutra is trying to do, or one thing the Buddha is trying to do to Subhuti is confound the mind. <laughs> the mind that is used to thinking very linearly, very rationally in that sense, that mind is truly being challenged by this analogy. But there's something even deeper going on with this idea. And what it is, and now this is where I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to do something here. I don't know if I'll be successful. But that analogy of having a Ganges River for every single grain of sand, the Ganges River, is actually kind of pointing to something. That analogy is pointing to an idea. And the idea, it's so subtle and simple, but so absolutely profound. 
And what it is, is the Buddha will often say, without one, there cannot be many. But without many, there cannot be one. And that's a really, so let me break that down for you. So the idea is, is that we have this idea of one, like, you know, like one finger, right? And the saying is, is that one, in a way, that you cannot have one without the idea of many. And you can't have the idea of many without the idea of one. So let's actually work backwards. If I were to say to you, how many? And you said five. What I want you to notice is, is that you don't get to have the number five without this one, meaning you couldn't possibly conceive of the number five without the idea of one, because five is five ones. <laughs> like that's what five is, that's what many is. So in order to even conceive of the idea of multiple, you already have the idea of the singular, the one. Now that was the second part of it, that you couldn't have one without the idea of many, or I should say you can't have many without the idea of one. But now let's go back to the beginning of that, which is that the idea of one implies many. And the reason why that is true is, is that if there weren't multiple, the idea of singularity and oneness would make no sense. There would be no need for this idea of oneness if there wasn't the idea of multiplicity. So this is, a, this is basically an aspect of dependent co-origination, but this is not dependent co-origination where uh, me and my wife co-arise when we get married, or me as teacher and you as student co-arise when there is teaching happening. This is not that kind of dependent origination. This is a very deep level of conceptualization and recognizing that you cannot have the idea of one without the idea of many, and you can't have the idea of many without the idea of one. So that idea that one already contains within it the multiple and multiple contains within it the singular, that idea is being played out in this idea of these having Ganges rivers for every grain of sand in the Ganges river. In other words, what it's kind of pointing to is this sort of, this idea of a grain of sand of the Ganges River. That idea already contains, already implies the entirety of the Ganges River. Does so that make sense? That idea that you that the very idea of a single grain of sand of the Ganges River implies this whole Ganges River. You don't get to have that one single grain of sand of the Ganges River without there already being this Ganges River. So there's a way in which this analogy is pointing to this sort of, well, what the tradition will come to call the interpenetration of all dharmas. And it's the idea that we think that the idea of singular is over here and the idea of multiple is over there. But the interpenetration of these ideas is showing you that the one already kind of contains the other one. 
by a sort of conceptual necessity, if you will. It's con- you, you just don't get to have a grain of sand of the Ganges River if there isn't already an entire Ganges River there already. And so this analogy of having a grain of sand for each of the grains of sand of the Ganges River is, again, kind of pointing to that. And I would strongly suggest that that way of thinking, the interpenetration of all dharma's way of thinking, that's sort of the inconceivable in that way. And of course, now we're beginning to see the relationship between calculability and conceivability in that sense. Before I go any further, yeah, because I'm, yeah, actually, this will this will segue very well into my next section. But this idea about the number of things, one and many, in that way, that does. I already mentioned it, but it spills into this other idea that's wrapped up in this, which is the idea of incalculable. And the idea is, is that the grains of sand of the Ganges River are theoretically, theoretically calculable. Granted, it may take a number of a while to do and all of that. But the idea is, is that the number of grains in the, of sand in the Ganges River is hypothetically calculable. But as soon as we start to get into the realm of the interpenetration of dharmas where one already contains the multiple, counting starts to get a little tricky at that point. (laughs) Because as soon as you have counted to one, you have already counted all the way. And now we're going to count two which is all the way. So it just becomes compounded at that point. So what happens is, is that this idea of inconceivability, it actually becomes sort of the foundation for, I wouldn't say a school of Buddhism. It's sort of a foundational concept to Mahayana Buddhism in general. But this idea of the inconceivable becomes sort of synonymous with a kind of genre of Buddhist sutras. So the most famous, of course, is the giant Avatamsaka Sutra, otherwise known as the Bhuttavatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra. Uh, I think my copy's in another room right now, but you know, it's this big multi-volume sutra. The Avatamsaka Sutra is often nicknamed the Inconceivable Sutra. And it has to do with the fact that it talks a lot about inconceivability, but it is also very much about this interpenetration of dharmas that I'm discussing. And I wanted to just share with you really quickly in, so it's all the way in chapter 30 of the Avatamsaka Sutra now. And chapter 30 is a pretty short chapter, and it's actually called The Incalculable. And what happens is, is that a bodhisattva named Mind King, great name for a bodhisattva. So the bodhisattva Mind King comes to the Buddha and says, hey, world honored one. The Buddhas are always talking about incalculable, measureless, boundless, incomparable, innumerable, unaccountable, unthinkable, immeasurable, unspeakable, untold of numbers. What are these? (laughs) That's what he said. What are those? So the Buddha says, excellent, excellent. It's great. It's great that you should ask this. Let me tell you a little bit about it. And then this is how this chapter reads. The Buddha says, 10 to the 10th power 
or sorry, 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 10 to the 10th power times 10 to the 10th power equals 10 to the 20th power. 10 to the 20th power times 10 to the 20th power equals 10 to the 40th power. 10 to the 40th power times 10 to the 40th power equals 10 to the 80th power. 10 to the 80th power times 10 to the 80th power equals 10 to the power of 160. And this goes on <laughs> for page after page. And I don't know if you'll be able to see, but this starts to just become pure mathematics where we have these, and it all stems by the way, from 10 to the 10th power times 10 to the 10th power. So it begins in a calculable mode, if you will. But then we eventually get up to this gargantuan number. After all of that multiplication, we get to this gargantuan number that I don't even know how to say, because I only know up to like a trillion. I don't even think I know what comes after a trillion, quintillion or something. But so I don't even know how to say this number. But that number, which is so large, I don't even know how to say it. It says that squared. <laughs> and it starts squaring these gigantic numbers until it finally arrives at a gargantuan number that is, and it's here. You could read it. It's like, I won't even bother you with the numerals, but this gargantuan number. And then the Buddha says, that squared is 10 to the power of, and then this gigantic, gigantic number. And then he says, and that squared is an incalculable. An incalculable to the fourth power is measureless. A measureless to the fourth power is a boundless. A boundless to the fourth power is an incomparable. An incomparable to the fourth power is an innumerable. An innumerable to the fourth power is an uncountable. An uncountable to the fourth power is an unthinkable. An unthinkable to the fourth power is an immeasurable. An immeasurable to the fourth power is an unspeakable. An unspeakable to the fourth power is an untold of, which is unspeakably unspeakable. An untold of multiplied by itself is a square untold of. <laughs> and then there's this beautiful poem that finishes the chapter that begins to speak of untold of unspeakables filling all unspeakables in unspeakable numbers of kalpas. And it goes on like that. <laughs> so that's where these uh, grains of sand of the Ganges River, it eventually culminates in a chapter like that, that again, it's, it's mind boggling, the kind of, um, what's mind boggling is the kind of the, the information you're being asked to conceive of in that sense. So, all right, is everybody doing okay with this inconceivability business? Okay, because we have definitely much more to, to get to. So the other thing that happens, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears. We're still going to talk about the inconceivable, but we're going to be talking about it not from that um, uh, kind of more mathematical calculability side of it. I want to introduce sort of something more in the realm of meditation. So another important thing about the Avatamsaka Sutra is it is famous for outlining, explaining, describing what is known as the Achintya Vimoksha, the inconceivable liberation. So the Achintya Vimoksha, the inconceivable liberation, is a meditative state for, for lack of a better term. So it, it could be, and I think it's sometimes referred to as a samadhi, so a state of concentration. But here's the thing about 
what well what makes this uh samadhi meditation vimoksha liberation what makes it inconceivable well let's see i always have these sort of two angles let's start with this i'm going to start with something very very simple so what's the the simple aspect of this is is this so, so much of Buddhist meditation has to do with meditative objects. And that object can be the breath. It can be a little flame of a candle. It could be an elemental disc called a kashina. It could be a statue. It could be a word like a mantra. But many forms of Buddhist meditation use a meditative object. And so what you have is a meditator meditating upon a meditative object. And the idea is, is that that form of meditation where there's me meditating on the candle flame or me meditating on my breath, from what we're talking about tonight, that's all very conceivable. <laughs> and what makes it conceivable is that it is predicated on the subject-object relationship. And for a quick shorthand for the rest of the evening, I would really put it very simply as what is the inconceivable? that which is beyond the subject-object relationship. What is conceivable? Subject-object relationships. Self and other. And so this inconceivable liberation is this really kind of interesting type of meditation. Again, this is all going to get very, very tricky. But one way to think about this is like this. So there's a really interesting way that we think. And the interesting way that we think is we think in terms of inside of us and outside of us. You know, we talk about our internal organs, right? We talk about our our organs being inside of us. And then we talk about the world being outside, but even say the, the hairs on my arms are, are on the outside, right? So you probably think this way. I know that the default mode for me is to think that way, to think in terms of inside me. And if it's, if it's something that's going on inside, I might need to go get an x-ray or an ultrasound or something to go inside and look. And if it's something outside, I could use a mirror and I could look in a mirror. So we have this very clear, very clear, very obvious distinction of inside me and outside of me. Now, I already just mentioned actually that one aspect of outside of me is, well, everything that's not me. <laughs> everything that's not me is outside. There's, there's a little bit, right? The hairs, you, maybe you could say the, the, the epidermis or whatever, like the outer skin layer, like yeah, I guess you could say those are, my ears are outside, my nose is outside, and then I have all the things inside. But what I want you to kind of start thinking about is how kind of arbitrary that, or not arbitrary, but I would even ask you to try to locate the dividing line between inside and outside. Like, how about your tongue, your tongue, for example? Is that inside you or outside? 
oh, it's one of those funny things that moves inside and outside. But like, is are my teeth inside? Or are they outside? If you start in examining this, you realize that it seemed so simple in the beginning, inside, outside. But when you actually start to investigate this distinction you're making between inside you and outside, it's actually not as clear as that, right? The problem though, is that the entire subject object relationship is predicated on this idea of inside and outside of you. So my point is, is that if we play the, if we play the where are you game, and by the where are you game, what I mean is, you know, I always walk everybody through this. Let's walk through it really quickly. We say, I have a hand. I have two hands, actually. And when I say that, when I think that grammatically, when I say I have two hands, what I'm acknowledging is that if through an unfortunate accident, I were to lose my hands, I would say, I don't have any hands anymore. But what that means is, is that the hands were not essential to who I am because I have hands, then I don't have hands, but I'm still here. I, and I presume that that goes for your feet as well, that you could lose your feet and still be you, right? And then I assume that goes for legs, elbows, Last time I checked, we can get heart transplants, kidney tra transplants, all kinds of transplants. So in other words, I could get a new heart. What I'm, when I say that, when I say I could get a new heart, I'm admitting that I am not the heart because I could get a new one. So where is this you of yours? And that's where everybody, of course, wants to say between the ears and behind the eyes, of course, that's where I am. So you're inside, you're inside you. No, oh, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense at all. You're inside you, right? That doesn't work. So all of this language games that I'm playing now is just to point out about how we begin with such a clear, certain idea of what we are, where we are, what we are, what's inside, what's outside, all of that. But with a little bit of what would be called vipassana, a little bit of insight work, we realize that the distinction between inside and outside is actually not that clear. And ultimately, we don't even know what we are. Meaning, I say that I have hands, I have a heart, I have this, I have that. But okay, what are you then? And that's where we go, huh? Now we could keep searching. We could, we could keep searching for that self maybe in uh, synaptic patterns. I'm a synaptic pattern or something. And then that starts to sound even more ridiculous, right? Did a synaptic pattern go have lunch today? <laughs> so my point is, is that the, the normal notions of subject and object that seem so solid, again, just with a little bit of inquiry, we realize, wow, those are all very arbitrary in that sense. Now, I want to return to my original example of the inside outside one. So if I've done, if I did this correctly, I don't know if I did, but right now you should have no idea what the self is or where it is. <laughs> and because of that, there's a way in which this distinction of inside me and outside me, which 
inside and outside was based upon the physical body. But I just said, I'm not a physical body. I have a physical body. So my point is, is that the inside and outside distinction that we're making, like it's, it's truly kind of arbitrary in that way. And so what the inconceivable liberation is that is described in the Avatamsaka Sutra, that's described in the Vimalakirti Sutra, by the way, the inconceivable liberation is a kind of a samadhi, a kind of a meditation where, well, how can I put it? It's a, a kind of a meditation where the normal kind of meditation that's about subject and object and about how I'm meditating on that thing, that whole way of thinking is predicated on the inside outside idea upon the self and other idea. But if, if inside and outside are not like that, then it kind of begins to collapse the subject object relationship. And so what I'm getting at is, is that the way that the inconceivable meditation is described, it's described as the bodhisattva sort of entering into a meditative state upon, say, their breathing, but then exiting the meditative concentration in the external field of sensory awareness. And then settling into a samadhi concentration in this kind of inside outside way and then returning through different sensory organs <clears throat> excuse me so it's a form of i guess a kind of visualization again a kind of a meditation that really turns the meditator inside out to where to be meditating on an external object is to be meditating upon an internal object. And that's where all of a sudden the bodhisattva in this meditation can seemingly flip entirely inside out to where the entire universe is now <laughs> kind of inside of you in that way, because you've <laughs> flipped it in that sense. <clears throat> Tanya. So this sounds like non-dual meditation, or at least a form of non-dual meditation. <clears throat> it is a form of non-dual meditation. Yeah, it's a very special form of it, I would say. Mm -hmm. Vicky, is that you? Oh, no. You're, you're muted. Oh. <laughs> you just said that all of this leads to the conclusion that the entire universe is inside you. Is that in the same sense as 20 minutes ago, you were talking about like the entire Ganges River is implied in the single grain? Is it the same? It's the same thing. Thank you, Vicki. Excellent. Because... <laughs> Your, your comment's totally spot on. <clears throat> I love the way you put together my earlier remarks. <clears throat> what the inconceivable liberation and the Avatamsaka Sutra will talk a lot about, they spend a lot of time talking about hair pores <laughs> and that all, all of the universe is in a hair pore of the Bodhisattva's body. And that is very much the kind of entire Ganges River in each grain of sand of the Ganges River. And I have been working with the metaphor of the hair pores, where they keep talking about all these events and all of these things happening in every hair pore of the Buddha's body or every hair pore of the Bodhisattva's body. I'm, I'm feeling more and more comfortable the more that I read the way that that is used, I'm more and more comfortable kind of 
interpreting that, I wouldn't translate it, but interpreting that with the modern, the modern phrase, every cell of our body. So the early Buddhists were talking about hair pores, but the way they use it, I think that they would be happy with the idea of every single cell of your body containing the entire universe, the entire everything else, like the kind of everything that is not that cell. <laughs> so the whole inside, uh, outside is contained within it. And there's a few different ways to actually arrive at that understanding that the entire universe is in every cell of your body. There's the conceptual way that Vicky alluded to that I mentioned regarding sort of the every grain of sand of the Ganges River or the number one containing the many and vice versa. You could get there that way. You could definitely get there meaning understanding how every cell of the body contains the universe, you could get there conceptually that way. But I would also suggest thinking of it this way. So when I first started studying the, the inconceivable, when I first started learning more about this, I sort of had a little, mm, you could call it a realization, if you will, but just a kind of an insight. And it's an insight that has stayed with me for ever since I first had it. And it was an insight that came to me while walking in a forest one day. Great ideas always come in, in walks in the woods. But it was a particular kind of, again, a kind of realization. And it was the realization that walking through these woods and seeing all these trees and all these plants, and in particular, all of these leaves, I had this realization, and it was about how each, each and every leaf in a forest, if you think about it the right way, every single leaf is kind of exactly where it needs to be as far as growing towards the light. And uh, you've, you've had this experience, I know you have. When you've, seen, um, when you've seen a tree, like a crooked tree, and you can see how clearly that tree is trying to get sunlight, and you can see it actually bending around like an obstacle, like maybe a, a boulder or another tree, and you can see the branch bend and curve and grow up towards the sun. And when you see it, it's so obvious like, oh, that the bend of that tree branch matches the path of the sun. It matches east to west. The arc of the sun and that tree branch are in a kind of uh, synergy, if you will. And again, not only the branch that's growing a certain way to get the most amount of sunlight, or maybe not even the most amount of sunlight. Maybe it's trying to avoid getting too much sun. But the point is, is that that branch is right where it needs to be. And all of the leaves on that branch are right where they need to be. But not only that, you can kind of begin to kind of see into that branch. And you begin to realize that the arc of the sun and the seasons, and in a way, the entire ecological history of that forest is present in every single leaf. Because that leaf couldn't have been that leaf without that tree and that tree couldn't have been that tree without that soil and that soil couldn't have been that soil without all of those things dying into it and all of those things dying into it couldn't have existed without that forest. And so you can begin to see not just at a conceptual level, but at a, at a kind of interpenetrating level, you can begin to see how the entire forest is in each leaf 
of the forest in a kind of beautiful, again, a kind of beautiful synergetic way. Now, what I'm describing, of course, is also described as Indra's net, that beautiful Buddhist image of that net of jewels where every single jewel contains within it a reflection of all the other jewels of Indra's net. And that brings us right back to the Ganges River analogy, brings us right back to that idea of all dharmas actually containing all other dharmas within them. And that is, I would suggest, the sort of the nature of the inconceivable. When, when you're seeing leaves that way, not just as outgrowths of branches, but as these kind of uh, kind of deeper dharmas in that way, but in dharma, by which I mean a phenomena, a deeper phenomena. All right, everybody feeling okay with the inconceivable? Yeah, yeah. Could, could you uh, either describe that meditation again or tell us where it, where it comes from? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So so in the Vimalakirti Sutra, which of course I've taught at uh, SFDC, there is an entire chapter that is called the inconceivable. I believe that is chapter six of the Vimalakirti is the inconceivable. Now, that chapter is more about Vimalakirti, the, the star of that sutra, demonstrating the inconceivable liberation. If you want to actually sort of read and experience it, then you would need to go to the Avatamsaka Sutra, so the big flower garland sutra. You would need to go to chapter 12, which is called uh, the Bodhisattva Bhadra Shri. So Bhadra Shri or Bodhisattva uh, good, uh, chief in goodness or something like that. That's the main Bodhisattva that gives the teaching. And actually in that chapter 12, there are a few different samadhis that are described. The inconceivable samadhi is one of them. And let's see. And yeah, and it goes on for a few pages and it's just a, a guided type of thing, meaning it describes how the Bodhisattva enters into Samyak Samadhi. So right samadhi, which is a reference to the Eightfold Path, actually the eighth step on the Noble Eightfold Path. But it says that the Bodhisattva enters right samadhi. So you're concentrating, you're focusing, you're entering samadhi on the eye organ and then emerging from samadhi in the field of visible forms. And then entering right concentration in the field of visible forms and emerging from right samadhi in the eye organ without any disturbance to the mind, it describes. So this whoop, inside, outside, with the mind not being disturbed by that. Um, and then it goes on and does it for the ear, for the nose, for the tongue, for the, and then it, it actually keeps going in a, it gets pretty psychedelic in that way, where you really kind of are being not torn apart. It's a very gentle meditation in that way, but you are definitely being turned inside out as I described. So yeah, Tanya. So this discussion too about, um, you know, interpenetration and this inconceivability, and if you have one, you have many, but with this interpenetration, there's neither one nor many. It feels to me like you're getting to like thusness through this or suchness. Is that like kind of? Yeah. 
Definitely, definitely. Um, again, I think I said it at the very beginning, it's going to be tempting to kind of mash together emptiness and the inconceivable and suchness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a way in which all of that is sort of, you know, they are all kind of talking about the same thing, but they're not, that mm -hmm. there are these subtle differences. And so the... For me, let me say this kind of a last thing, that, unless there's a little more questions, I'm happy to answer. But the last thing that I kind of want to say for me about the inconceivable, like I want to go back to the some original things I was, I was saying about how meditation on an object by someone <laughs> is very conceivable. And what we're describing is this inconceivableness because of dissolution of self, no subject and object, the inside outness and all of that. The thing though, for me about the inconceivable is it's very much about, mm, well, it's certainly about the limits of knowledge or the limits of intellect in that way. But particularly, and let me just put it to you this way. So it has to do with, it has to do with names and words. And I'm going to have to summarize a very profound idea very quickly, but I've talked about it many times before. But it's this basic idea that you come to, you come to this realization either through emptiness or dependent origination, but it's this realization that everything is just a word. And deeper than that, you realize that every word is sort of dependent upon all these other words to get its meaning. You know, like up. Up is dependent upon down. So the word up is a label. It's a description. And even though if I asked you, where is up, you would point and go, well, it's, it's up there. But a little bit of insight again, and we realize, oh, up, up is just a word and it gets its meaning from down, but down gets its meaning from up. And that's called dependent origination in that way. But what I'm leading you to is this realization that A, everything is just a word. And as a word, it's dependent upon a bunch of other things to be defined, to get its meaning. So when you're realizing that, one thing happens, which is everything then gets put on this even playing field because everything is equally a word. And so if I were to say to you, uh, Jupiter, <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, that's a planet, that's a whole planet. And then I were to say, you know, uh, uh, a lint, lint, lint ball, you would probably, of course, then say, well, Jupiter's a whole planet, and a lint ball is just a tiny little nothing. But as a word, Jupiter is not any bigger or better or crazier than the word lint ball. Jupiter just stands in relationship to Mercury, Venus, Earth, and these other words, whereas a lint ball stands in relationship to my dryer and my clothes and all these other words. So if you're following me on that, everything's words, Words are dependent on other words, and therefore all words are kind of equal. Then all of a sudden what happens is it becomes a question of how do you talk about something that's not a word? How do you conceive of something? without a name for it, 
right? I often, I often like to point do this one, right? I got my, I got my special little box here. Do you, do you want what's inside of it? Can you even conceive of what's inside of it? You haven't seen it. I haven't told you what it is. You haven't heard it. You haven't smelt it. You haven't tasted it. You haven't touched it. You haven't done any of these things. So how, how could you describe what's in there when you don't have any words to go on? You don't have any anything to go on, right? I would suggest that the inconceivable is right over there. <laughs> it's right past all the language and the words and everything. And so we will use one descriptor. We will use one word to point at it and we'll call it inconceivable. So the idea is, is that the in, that word, the, the very idea of the inconceivable is pointing at that which is just beyond language and conception in that way. So, everybody doing okay with all of those beautiful, profound ideas? Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? I'll ask one more really quick one. Please, please. You, this is, when you were talking especially about the forest, which made sense, it reminded me of, I remember at the, when we were at the old space, you used to talk about the monolith and like, it's like, it's not all the individual things in the room. It's like if you saw the reflection of the room in a mirror and it's like the picture in the mirror is, are we talking about, is that the same idea that we're talking about now? That is very much the internet interpenetration of all dharmas idea. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Making Absolutely. sure I was making the right connection. Thanks. Yep. Another great uh, comparison to other ideas. Definitely. Okay. Well, on that note, then we are primed up. We are ready to hear a little bit more about Manjushri Bodhisattva's Buddha land. So just as a reminder, this is the sutra that we've been reading now for weeks and weeks and months, actually. We've gotten to a part in the sutra where the Bodhisattva Manjushri has been telling us about these 10 vows, right? As I mentioned, these bodhisattvas, they always have these kind of um, wishes, vows that they've made, these sort of vows that they're, that they're Buddha lands, that when they become fully enlightened Buddhas, their Buddha land will be a certain way, and that, that they won't achieve full enlightenment as a Buddha unless it is this way. So we've been hearing these 10, or we're up to number 10. So we've heard nine of Manjushri's vows regarding his Buddha land. And I won't um, kind of go over those, go watch the other videos of the uh, previous classes, but let's read about Manjushri's 10th vow regarding his Buddha land. So Manjushri again addresses the Buddha saying, I also have this vow that all the virtuous adornments of the Buddha lands of all the immeasurable, incalculable hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayuttas of Buddhas will all fill my single Buddha land. With the exception of those two Buddha teachings of the two vehicles. Um, yeah, and then I'll, let me just finish this paragraph. Manjushri goes on to say, world honored one, if I myself explained the kinds of virtuous adornments of my Buddha land, I couldn't finish doing so even in, even in as many kulpas as numerous as the sands of the Ganges River. What my vows are like, only the Buddha knows. Okay. So just really quickly, just to give you a sense of what all of this is about, if you haven't been coming to the prior classes. So Manjushri has these really, really high uh, kind of, not expectations, but these high dreams of his, of his Buddha land in that way. And so just to summarize what he just said, so 
you know, Buddhas, Buddhas are understood to be extremely virtuous people, right? Just exuding kindness, compassion, just exuding moral virtue, right? And so a Buddha, when they purify their existential experience, when they purify their Buddha land, their Buddha land is full of all kinds of virtuous adornments, these embellishments of virtuosity in that sense. Manjushri vows that all the virtuous adornments of all the Buddha lands in immeasurable, incalculable hundreds of thousands of millions of nayuttas of Buddhas, that all of those <laughs> will fill his single Buddha land. All right. So that's, you know, why would you want to go to any other Buddha land then? Really is, is the question. So, and then of course, there's this kind of funny thing where he's like, I, I can't even explain them all. I can't explain how great my Buddha land is going to be. Only the Buddha knows how great my Buddha land is going to be. To which the Buddha says, so it is Manjushri. So it is. The Buddha, the Tathagata, knows and sees past, present, and future without any limits or obstructions. So then at that time, <clears throat> there were some bodhisattvas in the assembly who had this thought. They wondered, will the virtuous adornments of the Buddha land attained by Manjushri be like those of the Buddha land of Amitabha Buddha? So I mentioned this briefly, uh, maybe, I don't know if it was last week or two weeks ago or whenever it was, but I mentioned that this sutra that we're reading, the Manjushri Pure Land Sutra, I mentioned that it's kind of an interesting sutra because it, it demonstrates a knowledge of this tradition of Amitabha Buddha. So Amitabha or Amitabha, right, is this other Buddha, not the historical Buddha, but they, they call Amitabha a cosmic Buddha, a Buddha from a different realm. And that Buddha, Amitabha or Amitabha, that Buddha land's pure land is one of the oldest pure lands spoken about in Mahayana Buddhism. There is a sutra, the Amitabha Buddha Sutra, that describes Amitabha's pure land. And it's a very famous sutra. It's kind of the foundation of what is called the pure land sect or the pure land school of Buddhism is the Amitabha Sutra. So it's interesting that this sutra knows all about that sutra. Even though that sutra, the Amitabha Sutra, is considered a, a later sutra, meaning it's not part of the Hinayana, it's not part of the early tradition, it's kind of early Mahayana. So this sutra knows all about that, which makes this kind of maybe even like third gen, like third generation in that way. But the point is, is that, let's see, I don't, I don't have it here, but there is a whole sutra that describes the Sukhavati Vyuha, the land of bliss, the land of Amitabha Buddha. Life in Amitabha Buddha's pure land is, you know, the descriptions of it are, are immaculate, beautiful, you know. And so all the bodhisattvas in the audience, right, they want to know, will Manjushri's Buddha land be like Amitabha's Buddha land, right? At that time, the world honored one, knowing the thoughts on the minds of those bodhisattvas, told the bodhisattvas, suppose someone were to split a single hair into 100 parts and then take a, a single 
one of those parts of a hair. And with that, and with that single part, they were to take a single droplet of water from the ocean. The Buddha says that single little droplet of water is like the virtuous adornments of the Buddha land of Amitabha. And that entire great ocean that's left over is like the virtuous adornments of the Buddha land of, of, of Manjushri. And actually, even that comparison is an insufficient one, it says. <laughs> and why? Because the virtuous adornments of the Buddha land of Manjushri are inconceivable. Okay, so, uh, and I will read a little bit more, but that's the gist of it. So there we have arrived at the theme for tonight, the idea of inconceivability. And we are basically told that Manjushri's Buddha land, inconceivable, right? But it's told in a very funny way. And I have to tell you that, you know, I was actually, I was gonna mention this at the beginning of the class. There's a lot of, um, what can I say? You know, there's a lot of scholarship, of course, a lot of his historians, a lot of scholarship that are, you know, that uh, it used to be more popular. It's not so popular nowadays, but a lot of scholarship on whether the Buddha really existed. If, just like there's a lot of scholarship about whether Jesus really existed and all of that. Obviously, there's a lot of scholarship about was the Buddha like one person, like one real person, or is it actually the sayings of a lot of different people that have all been lumped under the name the Buddha? Like, you know, which is it? And most um, most scholars, most historians do believe that there was a person, the Buddha, and they b believe that or they think that for a number of different reasons. But one of the reasons that I, I've read about, I've read different, you know, uh, scholars who have this uh, position, one of the things, and, and I agree with it, when you read the Pali Canon, when you read all of those sutras, there's a certain, like, I don't know how to describe it. You kind of, in a way, have to read a lot of sutras to really begin to see it. But there's a real, like, personality to the Buddha. He's kind of funny, actually, in a way. He's, like, kind of humorous, not too serious, and kind of speaks a certain way. And, you know, who knows? No, you know, I don't know if we'll, we will ever know or if it's ever even knowable in that way. But from my opinion, when I read the Pali Canon, it does seem like it was, it's all out of the mind of the same person. So now I've already mentioned probably in numerous other Dharma talks that a sutra like we're reading tonight, even, even a sutra like the big Avatamsaka Sutra, they, they don't even pretend to be sutras from back in the days of the Buddha. Like th these are very cognizant of the fact that, that, they're, they, that they're literature. I've say, I say this on many Sunday nights. These sutras are aware that they're literature and all of that. However, not that I think they are all of the mind of one person that would be called Siddhartha Shakyamuni or the Buddha, but there is a kind of, um, I just want to kind of call it a sense of humor that is very consistent through the sutras. And I don't know if it's the kind of thing that if, if you just get enlightened in a certain way, you become funny like this. Like, I, I don't know what to ascribe it to, but there is just this kind of consistent tenor, I want to call it like a consistent tenor or a consistent vibe of sutras where they're 
they're all very similar. And you don't get a sutra out of nowhere that's all of a sudden really stern and really harsh and really like, it's really interesting the way they all stay like within this kind of bandwidth. And so for me, part of the humor is this funny idea of taking a single hair, splitting it into a hundred pieces, and then taking one of those and soaking up a single drop of water and then comparing the whole ocean to that one droplet of water, like a, you, a hair would have been enough, right? <laughs> Say like one hair, one drop would have been enough, but no, we've got to split that hair into a hundred pieces. So we get the smallest conceivable droplet of water. For me, this stuff makes Buddhism endearing to me. It's, I love it, you know? So I just want to point these things out to you. So, and if that weren't enough, uh, let me, yeah, let me finish reading a little bit of this so that we see where this is going for next week. So what happens after this comparison? Where, and by the way, if I didn't emphasize this, Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land is supposed to be like, you know, mind-bogglingly beautiful and mind-bogglingly wonderful. So to say that Manjushri's is infinitely more inconceivable in that sense is saying a lot. So at that time, the Bodhisattvas addressed the Buddha saying, world honored one. Is there any other Buddha land with virtuous adornments as magnificent as that Buddha land of Manjushri anywhere throughout the whole universe? The Buddha said, there is. <laughs> East of here, past hundreds of millions of world systems, as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges River, there is a Buddha land named abiding in the supreme vow. There's a Buddha there named king of an ocean of universal light and eternal virtue. That Buddha's lifespan is immeasurable and endless. And it, he is ex ever expounding and explaining the Dharma to bodhisattvas. The adornments of that land of the Buddha compared to the Buddha land of Manjushri is without any difference. And then it says, there are also four bodhisattvas cloaked in inconceivable armor, fully accomplished in all their vows, and they will in the future also attain Buddha lands with adornments equal to the adornments of Manjushri's Buddha land. And then the bodhisattvas say, oh, well, we wish for the Buddha to tell us the names of those bodhisattvas and where they abide. We also wish to behold the Buddha, king of an ocean of universal light and eternal virtues Buddha land in order to bring much benefit to this great assembly. Why? Bodhisattvas who see and hear of this will go on to accomplish all of their vows. And then the Buddha says, listen closely, and I'll tell you about it next Sunday. So I'm going <laughs> to leave us there. I just want you to know, though, really, really quickly, for, for those of you who I know come every Sunday night and all of that, you'll know that the sutra that we're reading is also in this book. An English translation is also in this book, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. But as you may remember, if you've come to Dharma Doors, this book has a really big problem. And the problem is, is that they like to just take parts of the sutra out and not tell you about it. Well, this whole thing I just read at the end about how there's another Buddha land that's equally good and it's got these four bodhisattvas and all of that, it's not in here. <laughs> they, did, they didn't think you wanted to know about these other bodhisattvas and all of that. 
So just to kind of a heads up that next week, when we get into hearing about these other uh, bodhisattvas, we'll be relying on the Tibetan translation that is always in the chat. All right, unless there's any other questions, comments, answers, ideas, yeah, Tanya. You know, that book, every time you say that, I'm like, ah, do they even say anything like an in introduction? Like, by the way, when you see these dot, dot, dots, or, you know, we just took stuff out. Do they, do they say why or anything? Like, they do not say why. And they do say yeah. in, in the introduction, they say, by the way, parts are omitted and, and it's indicated by the ellipses, by the dots. But as I've said, the problem with that is that sometimes they literally take out a word or they take out pages and pages and pages of text. And there's no way for the, the reader that doesn't have the Chinese version, there's no way to know, am I missing a huge amount or am I not, you know? And I have to say it, Tanya, since you bring it up, I will mention it. You know, that, that makes this book problematic in two ways. On the one hand, you know, sutras are sacred scripture. Mm -hmm. And in most, you know, cases you hold them over your head, they're utterly, utterly sacred. So in a religious kind of Buddhist environment, it would be totally, totally, uh, what's the word, uh, sacrosanct or whatever. Like you would, you would never do this. You would never just, uh, randomly get rid of sections of the sutra now that's in a religious environment but you know this is published by penn state university press the person who oversaw this translation project is a scholar so it's in the world of scholarship well then as a scholar it's incredibly irresponsible to not give notes about how much text has been left out it basically makes this useless as a scholarly resource. Unfortunately, it's one of the only English translations of a lot of these sutras, so it's all we have to go on. But I've been wanting to point that out, that it's like either you're religious and you don't touch these things, or you're a scholar and you're more kind of careful about your documentation. So Yusha, you have a question, comment, answer? Or just, you're gonna bounce. Um Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your teaching tonight. Um, yeah, I, I just, I got to say, you know, the titles of these bodhisattvas, the, the lands, the, you know, all of these very like um, exceeding names and whatnot, you know, I have to say to me, like you said, they were very uh, like the, like the early poly things were kind of endearing and everything. I, I just, you know, these names and everything are one of my favorite things about the, um, this religion or psychology or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, I find them to be, you know, I, I find them to be ex just so beautiful. They're just so beautiful and they give me some hope uh about um it doesn't even matter if it's real mm. it's just it's more about you know, real in the and you know in an ontological sense or whatever but it's it it's so important for i think for us to um kind of break out of this this uh limited uh scope of 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 uh cogniz cognizing you know that we or I at least can fall into so easily, you know, this kind of Western positivist way. And so anyway, I love how you read them and you just, mm. you, you're, it's, there's no, you know, um, uh, sarcasm or anything or that it's, I just, I love the respect that you give these, uh, the readings and just thank you so much. I appreciate that comment very much. Uh, these are very, very dear very, very dear to me in that way. Um, and yeah, Yusha, I agree with, I was so, I didn't know where you were going with that at the beginning, I had to tell you, because um, not everybody is into the big, long, crazy bodhisattva names. I feel the same way you do. And as I often say, it's kind of a form of hypnosis to be talking about, you know, bodhisattva seeing all things as equal said to bodhisattva peaceful tranquil mind <laughs> it's sort of like oh 
<laughs> so, yeah. Thanks so and that's kind of, yeah. And I think that's kind of the point. It's like, it's almost, it kind of reminds me of like the Zen one hand clapping, you know, the sound it's like, it's trying to break our, you know, or that's hmm. how it feels. And that's, I welcome that at this point in my life. I mean, I just find it very useful and um, yeah. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Yusha. All right. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Always a pleasure on Sunday nights. Uh, and we will continue with Manjushri's uh, Pure Land next Sunday night. So see you then. Awesome, Michael. Well, before everybody takes off, um, I just wanted to check. Do you have any announcements? Oh, I do. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I am. I'm having. I'm offering a few classes of my own coming up this month and next. Uh, the main one I'd like to tell everybody about is my introduction to Buddhism class that I call Turning the Dharma Wheel. That's going to begin on October 1st. That's going to be a Saturday morning class, but there's also recordings available. So you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com, and find out all about that and register and all of that. Um, but I, I really encourage, you know, obviously I would like people to take my that class. But I would encourage even in a way like Dharma teachers to take it because it's kind of a, a whole other way of thinking about these original teachings. And so even if you're like, oh, I know the five skandhas, I know the four noble truths, it's still kind of a fresh take on all of those basic ideas. So that's my pitch on that. Thank you, Tanya.